best first timer at KiwiCon X, KiwiCon 10. Do you pronounce it 10 or X? The, the last, the last <laughs> KiwiCon, the last KiwiCon, she was the bestest. <laughs> yeah, last one. Um, so <laughs> she's going to pick our brain about the condensed history of lock picking. So let's make Grace Hill welcome. All right, thank you. Um, hello. So uh, let's just get right into it. Um, back in the day, locks were primarily for wealthy folk. Um, they wanted you to know that they were rich enough to have stuff that was valuable enough to lock up. Uh, in medieval times, they made their keys uh, quite large and used to wear them to show their status. This key here was uh, 31 centimeters, or is, I guess, it still exists. Um, here, you can see Justin Bieber wearing one just like it. <laughs> Um, the Romans sometimes would have their keys made into rings. Uh, these small keys were often used for trinket boxes. Uh, for some wealthier woman who could afford to have trinket boxes, this offered a small amount of agency. They could have small boxes where they could keep secrets, love letters, jewelry, uh, and often away from their husbands as well. Um, this was important because this was, you know, the world in a time where uh, it was woefully averse to independent women. Um, but here you can see one modeled by Mariah Carey. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so here is an old Chinese lock with a very impractical key. You can see it's massive. Uh, it's my face for scale. Um, <laughs> you can see that. Uh, and people also used to have outrageously large key charms. Um, so this... These charms had, uh, these, they would often be embroidered with like uh, signs of fertility and all sorts of strange things that seem very unrelated to locks. Um, and these are some of the key charms that I saw in a museum in South Korea. Um, that's where the previous uh, photo was from as well. So with all these loud proclamations of security, you can probably imagine how to some scumbags, it's like a shiny sticker saying, I bet you can't steal my super secure valuables. <laughs> um, the modern day equivalent uh, is something like this. <laughs> so modern day looks, looks look something like this. Uh, you can line up the gap in the pins um, and then the whole barrel will move, uh, turning the bolt. This design was patented by an American, um, Linus Yale Jr. Uh, in 1865. Keys became smaller and easier to mass produce. The idea has actually been around for some time though, having the, the pin and lock design. Um, the earliest example of this found so far was in the palace of this guy. Uh, this is Assyrian King Sargon II. It was found in Khorzabad, uh, which is now known as Iraq. Um, King Sargon II ruled in about 700 uh, BCE. Uh, this design, um, his locks, this one here, uh, it's basically a strange toothbrush-shaped thing, um, and this design traveled to Egypt as well. Uh, but it kind of vanished for a while and then arose back in the 1800s, and we'll get back to that. So the security rating of a lock is typically measured in time. This is because the longer uh, a pick lock, uh, sorry, a pick lock <laughs> is picking locks, the greater the window for being caught is. So essentially you just kind of want to like delay them and make them take a long time. Uh, so a lot of do lock design came down to security through obscurity. Let's take a quick tour of locks, uh, some of the beautiful loop-de-loops that people came up with to try and deter people. Uh, this one here is quite an ornate warded lock. Sorry, it's a little hard to see in this photo. Um, the contrast isn't that good. Uh, warded locks have a strange shape, and they try to make the lock mechanism hard to get to. Uh, here's a closer-up photo. These are fairly easy to bypass, though, because you can just bend a piece of wire to conform to the shape of the key. This here, this I really like this one. Um, this is a kicking man detector lock. So the keyhole is usually concealed by his leg, 
um, <laughs> which operates on a pivot. And when a button is pressed, the leg swings forward to reveal the keyhole. Um, the door bolt is released by tilting the man's hat. Uh, and the man holds a pointer against a dial that counts the number of times the lock has been opened. So it didn't really do much to necessarily deter people, but it would say, hey, I know how many times this has been unlocked. So if you do access it, then whoever's contents you've been trying to get to, they'll, they'll know about it. Um, so that was kind of like a way of trying to deter people. Some locks would employ a slightly more uh, persuasive way of trying to deter people. Um, these two locks have to be my favorite. The lion lock on the right will clamp down on your hand if you try picking it. Because <laughs> as you can see, the keyhole's like right in there. Um, and the one on the left has a small pistol embedded in the top right corner. <laughs> so these are kind of like, I guess, honeypots in a way. They try to trick you to get into it. But you can't really see. It's really hard to see the pistol in the corner. Um, so somebody would make a lock, somebody would pick it, then somebody would make a better lock, and somebody would pick that. And locks became more and more sophisticated until we reached the area they called perfect security. Ooh. Wow. Uh, so around, um, around 1800s, lock picking bounties and competitions were popping up all over the place. Uh, there was one um, very famous event, which was called the Crystal Palace. Um, this is the name of the spiritual world where people did myth together. <laughs> it was a big deal. There are lots of famous people here. Uh, you had people all over the world like um, Charlotte Bronte, Lewis Carroll, George Eliot, Charles Dickens, and Charles Darwin, and they all did myth together. Um, also at the event were these two locks that people believed impossible to pick. They were Brahma's lock and the Chubbs detector lock. Uh, so this is Brahma's lock. Um, Brahma was so confident in his lock uh, that he had it sitting in his shop window for two decades, waiting for it to be picked. He put out a massive bounty on it, which was 200 guineas, the equivalent of around $20,000 today. Um, sorry that the image of the mechanism isn't really that clear. Uh, this is the Chubbs detector lock. If you lift the levers too high, then it would seize, meaning that you know, the owner would come back knowing that the lock had been picked and failed, uh, and they would have to call the locksmith, um, and he would come along with like another key and turn the lock in the opposite direction to reset it. So the way that it did it is it just had like a little catch, it's kind of hard to see in here, um, and it would keep the levers just lifted up. Um, and uh, I think if you can see the smaller key on the, on the end there, that's the one that the... Um, that the locksmith would use to reset it. So the Chubbs detector lock is based on this five pin disc lock, uh, which turns out to be the exact lock at my parents' house. Uh, so <laughs> please don't rob me, lol. <laughs> um, so now along comes this guy called Alfred Hobbs, and he walks into the Crystal Meth Palace with all the swagger of Jay-Z. Um, Hobbs worked for Day & Newell, a lock making company in the US. Uh, he was a bit of a sneaky salesman, so what he would do is he would go around uh, picking people's locks, showing the vulnerability and how it's not secure at all, and conveniently he'd have his own locks that he could sell to people. Um, so, so he turned up, he traveled all the way to uh, the Crystal Palace uh, to try these challenge locks. Um, so with the challenge lock, he, his attempt required 51 hours, which was spread over 16 days. Um, and the Chubbs detector, the Chubbs detector lock, um, the way that he did that is he pretty much did like a brute force attack where he'd like deliberately catch the levers so they'd get stuck, find out where the tripping point was, and then he would reverse pick it to release it again, and he did that to each of the pins um, until he found out where all the tripping places were. Uh, so now that the era of perfect security is over, most people settle for the old tin and pin and tumbler lock based on Yale's design. As it turns out, lock picking challenges didn't really reflect the security concerns of the public. Uh, it was more for hobbyists. These locks were expensive, and most people want something cheaper that will mostly do the job. 
uh, turns out that there's lots of people who just forget to lock their doors or leave their doors wide open. So it's much easier for people to just kind of go to the places where there's literally no security than <laughs> go, for, go for a place that actually has a lock. Um, so, but these lock picking competitions were meant to show the public uh, how their locks could stand up to a fight, essentially. Um, it kind of ended up being a little bit of a waste of time. Uh, they were too extravagant, really. So here are some things, here are some uh, kind of counter, counterpoints that we, we see, we still see today to try and stop um, people from picking locks. So up, uh, these two ones here have side pins and they have dimples on the keys. So that way you can kind of fit in a lot more pins into a lock and it's like really hard to, to try and pick these rather than them all being in a straight line like they usually are. Um, and you can fit in way, way more pins. Like I had a work colleague, he showed me um, a lock that they were looking at uh, that had 36 pins. So as you can imagine, that would take quite a long time. Uh, the pins can also be serrated, which is these little gold things over here. So some of them are kind of spool-like and some of them are serrated. Uh, and that means that the pins get kind of caught on the shear line um, when, uh, when you try and twist, twist a barrel. So it can just kind of take a little longer. Uh, and we've also got a warded lock over there, which is kind of the same thing as the one that I showed you uh, in, like way back when. <laughs> So let's face it, it mostly comes down to trust. Like all security, the most effective attack is social engineering. So I'm going to leave you with a little anecdote. Uh, so this is Adam Worth. He is the real life criminal that Dr. Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes was based on. He did a jewelry heist in South Africa uh, by playing chess with a postmaster who looked after the safe keys in this, in this post office. So after three months of getting to know the guy, Adam sent packages to himself and went in at closing time at the post office. The guy entrusted him with the keys, including the safe key uh, which, where he could retrieve his packages. But he made uh, a wax copy of all the keys and subsequently stole a lot of jewelry which happened to be stored there. Uh, he traveled back to London uh, and sold the jewelry through his legit jewelry dealership and the only reason that we know that he did this crime is because he confessed it before he died <laughs> to a detective many, many years later. So he got away with it at the time. So remember, the easiest way to open the lock is with the key. Thank you. So we do have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Actual questions in the form of a question. Is that actually your cat? Uh, yes, it's my flatmate's cat. His name's Digby. <laughs> that was the important question. Very important, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a microphone here so we can hear people talking in the recording. So if anyone has a question. No questions? Great, must have been a good story. Uh, oh, you've got another one? Okay. <laughs> Is it a nice cat? Uh, <laughs> you know, he kind of yells a lot. Can I have a oh, you do? A real, a real question. Oh, okay. No, that wasn't. No, my question to ask a question wasn't the question. Um, I'm assuming you pick locks, is that correct? Uh, yes, kind of casually, but I'm still very novice. Do you have any suggestions for people who want to get started on lock picking, is what I was getting at? Yeah. Um, so usually, like, the way that I kind of got into it was by going to conferences, uh, which happened to have people there with locks and lockpicks, um, namely KiwiCon <laughs> and other security-related things. Uh, so what, what I kind of started out with was just trying, like, some handcuffs, which were very, very easy. Uh, and then um, when I was writing this talk, the local... Uh, ISIG meetup, so that's like the security interest group. Um, they lent me some of their lock picks and some locks, um, which was really cool because they're like, yeah, this is awesome, you should borrow these things. Uh, and so I played around with those. So basically it's kind of like uh, through talking to people, but there's, you can get some really basic uh, lock sets and some lock picking sets and some locks that are clear on the inside. Um, but yeah, I think like handcuffs were quite a good place to start because there's only like one pin essentially, at least in like the cheap ones that you can 
by. I don't know where these people got got their handcuffs from. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they seem to be like a good place to start. Yes? Uh, just on that, there's, um, there's an organization in New Zealand called Locksport, which is hobbyist lock picking. And a, a quick Google showed that there's something not dissimilar in Australia. So you could find hobbyist groups um, that are into this sort of thing, especially if you're in one of the central cities, I'm sure. Yeah, and there's... If we can have conversations in the hallway and have yeah. questions now, um, that would Also, be there's like a lock conference coming to Australia soon, so you can look out for that, LockCon, I think it's called. Yeah. So when I go on places like AliExpress and look for lock picks, there's the ones that you've shown, but there's the ones that kind of look like a gun, and the, you put uh, it in. Yes, yes. Have you ever used those? How do they work? Are they like 20 seconds done? What? Um, I haven't used them, but you do have uh, a thing where you can like bump locks, so I think it's kind of similar to that where uh, it applies pressure, puts like key shaped type thing in there, applies pressure which bumps all the pins up. And if it's not super well made or uh, the tolerance is like, it would just kind of lift all the pins above the shear line and you can kind of turn it quite quickly. So just by applying like more force kind of suddenly that will do that. Um, whereas if you're, uh, kind of doing it by hand, then usually you just kind of have to feel for where the pins get stuck and lift each one up um, manually. But yeah, so that's lock bumping. Some of, s locks tend to have grades, uh, and some of the more secure locks can be like hard to do that because they'll put in like watered uh, different shapes and stuff, so you can't even like get anything in there uh, like that. Yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. One last question. Someone at the back, make me run the entire length of the room. Come on. No? Okay, well, let's thank Grace for her time. Yay!